Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm Mark Schumacher, the CEO of the Home Furnishings Association. And this is a very special webinar today. About once a year, we have the ability to sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk to Todd Wanick, CEO and president of Ashley Furniture Industries, um, someone who is um, not just a titan in the industry, but somebody who is, is also a student of the industry and all that's going on. And so we're going to tap into Scott's brain, uh, Scott. Pod's brain today. Um, and I just um, want to let you know, though, you can still ask questions. Bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A tab there. We will, of course, be monitoring that. If you have a question, please do. And um, and also remember, myhfa.org forward slash webinar, you can actually listen to this again, if you'd like, um, on demand, or in fact, you can um, use it for a meeting, you know, to bring your team together and sit down and listen. But first and foremost, Todd, thank you uh, so much for joining us. I always appreciate the, the time. You're a good a uh, good friend to HFA and to the industry. So thank you for that, number one. Um, but we've got so much to talk about, but I have to start with parental privilege. I just have to do this. This past weekend uh, at Market, you had the ability to present your son Cameron for a Rising Star Award from IFRA. And um, you know he is one of a handful of the next generation coming up in Ashley. Um, how did that how did that feel? And what does that also say about Ashley's future when you have um, you know the next generation stepping up in a big way? No, it felt awesome, Mark. Uh, I can't uh, be more proud of Cameron and and um, the other rising stars. Uh, it was amazing to see. I, I thought that they did a great job. Um, Ifra did a great job presenting all the different rising stars and having their fathers and, and mothers um, present the award to them, which was actually quite fun. Um, it's amazing how much talent is really in the industry. And and I, I can't tell you how proud I am of Cameron. Um, uh, he's been a great son, you know, forever, of course, since, since he was born. And you know, I always say this, people are like, isn't it sad seeing your kids get older and everything else? Every year has been better for me with Cameron and, uh, you know, really enjoy our time together. Um, he's got different skills and what I have, different interests, which I think is really important in uh, in an organization to make sure that, number one, you know, my dad taught me this, don't compete with others, find ways to expand the organization. And that's one thing that Cameron has done for me. And Travis uh, Wagner, who's my nephew, runs our manufacturing operations in Laura Forsyth, who's in our merchand merchandising department. So it's just been an absolute pleasure to be able to work with them and, and be able to mentor them. Well, and this is this is a, a story that so many of, in our industry are dealing with, right? This fact of family succession, no matter how small or large the company, um, it's great to be able to have that kind of talent coming up through the ranks. But I just wanted to give you a chance. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, you um, know the other... The other important piece there, Mark, before we hit, before we lead yes. off of that is, you know, it's interesting as you get an ownership mentality in a business and every organization wants to get an ownership mentality with their people. And, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to have the next generation in, but I'm very proud of the fact that we have an ownership mentality in our business um, in many, many parts, you know, whether um, they're people that work with us or parts of the family, um, because they just take a different interest in the organization, the success of the organization. So, that's something that we really try to prompt and be very entrepreneurial and, and I'm very proud of our kids for being able to do it, but also the leaders within our business and, and the ownership mentality that they do have. And that, I mean, really and truly, we're not talking dollars here, but that's that's investing in the business truly, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. really the sustainability piece that you need to look for. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good, I mean, it's a great way to start because this is something that's germane to so many of the businesses in our industry. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have to start, unfortunately, <laughs> with um, a lot of the economic questions. Uh, if, you know, and so many of the people that have signed up to take part today have been interested in, in, in that. And if they're not aware, you know, you're someone who talks directly to a lot of the international banks on a regular basis, and you like to, uh, you, you know, you like to do that and really hear directly from them. So, can you give a little bit of a maybe a scene setter right now about what you're hearing, what you're seeing as far as where we are now, and perhaps the headwinds leading into to 2024. Yeah. So in preparation for this call, um, I had a chance to meet with four chief economists of Deutsche Bank, um, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and uh, who was a third? Who was a fourth one? Uh, a fourth bank. And uh, we had a nice conversation about the economy. I always pepper them with a lot of questions. UBS was a fourth one. Um, mm -hmm. And I pepper them with a lot of questions about the economy. Where do they see it going? What do they see for economic growth? What do they see as headwinds? And, uh, you know, quite honestly, um, the fourth quarter, they're very concerned about every bank. Um, they're, they're concerned about a government shutdown. They're concerned about student debt. They're concerned about a UAW strike. Um, and they're concerned about inflation. All four of those things, which which have an impact on the consumer. And it was interesting. Um, you know, one of them talked about student debt. There's $1.4 trillion of student debt and, and already 20 to 30% of them are delinquent, uh, which is going to affect the FICA scores going forward. 
But, um, you know, obviously, uh, they're very concerned about the fourth quarter, but they're also feeling that uh, GDP growth will be about 1% in the fourth quarter overall. Um, next year, they're forecasting about 1.5% GDP growth. And then I asked them specifically about uh, the furniture industry and what they see happening. And they're like, ah, you know what? Furniture industry has had a tough year, you know, overall, all the, all the metrics show it. Um, you know, but they really feel bullish in our industry, short term and long term, because we have this this tailwind coming, which is called millennials. Mm -hmm. Even though housing starts are, are slow, um, the millennials are coming into house formation and they're buying home furnishings. So companies that are relevant to the millennial audience and, and the younger consumer, um, it's really important that that we do a great job communicating with them because they're that it's a shifting buying power. Um, so they all commented on that and said that they felt very good about the furniture industry, not that we're going to have robust growth, but that we shouldn't continue to go down. Um, they feel, in their opinion, the furniture industry is probably roughly at bottom, plus or minus. And it's interesting what you just said about about millennials, because I think it's important to point out to folks that that this is not something that's that's coming. I mean, we're in the middle of the millennial shift right now, right? Don't don't they feel this will somehow be be sort of in full swing by 2030, which is not that far yeah. away? Am, am I correct in that? Yeah, that's 100 percent correct. Uh, there's a book called The Fourth Turning uh, written by a guy named Neil Howe. And uh, he talks about the millennial shift and, and how dramatic it is and every the fourth turning means every 25 years, you have a generational shift within a hundred year period of time. And uh, so we're on our fourth turning right now, right now, which means we had, we, which means we had three prior turnings and this is a fourth turning. And it really started to hit a pivotal point in about 2018, 2019. And by 2030, the buying power will completely shift from the baby boomers to the millennials. Um, and every year it obviously gets to be more and more. And uh, that that's important to know because that is where the buying power is in the marketplace, and, and we just got to make sure we're relevant with that customer. Let's let's talk about that for a minute. So, what do we know already about um, these these relevancy changes, if you will, uh, that any retailer, especially in home furnishing, need, needs to know? What are you seeing? Are those things that we talk about this millennial shift are definitively yeah. the challenges ahead? Well, I think uh, there's there's many, many things that, that you can point to in this generation. Um, they digest media differently than we do, right? They're, they're, they're more more social media savvy, and they're, they're really studying and on social media quite a bit. Um, so that's one of the big things, how they consume data. Um, they're much more uh, prone to buy online because they're more native and more prone towards technology. Um, we did a lot of work on understanding Facebook and Pinterest, and we did Google, I looked at the top searches based on this demographic, and they're much more clean lined. It doesn't mean that they're all contemporary. It means that the traditional customer, there's still one, there's still a transitional customer, there's still a country customer, there's still a contemporary customer. I'd say it's leaning more towards contemporary, but in all cases, when you look at all the product that they were searching for, it was much cleaner lined and uh, less goopy or traditional and you know, finishes more, more, more clean, more natural uh, and, and more natural materials. So, you know, when you look at home furnishings and specifically how it's going to affect us as an industry, we got to make sure that number one, our websites are great. Um, we're in social media channels that they're that they're searching on and that are on. Um, our product is relevant and our stores are exciting, you know, um, because they've got to be more contemporized than ever before. So um, that's a big shift that, that we're seeing in the marketplace because my generation, I'm the last year of the baby boomers, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, my generation like more traditional things. Um, this generation sways more towards contemporary. Again, not saying those other categories are gone, but uh, from a product design standpoint, you've got to think that through and just determine what it means for you as a as a retailer or manufacturer. And if this shift, as you've mentioned, has already been, let's just call it five years, five, six years in the swing. So yep. I would assume that you all are adapting to this now. And, and this is transitional. I mean, if anybody's listening to this and thinking that, you know, that tomorrow's when they're going to change or start adapting to this, your thing, it, you already have to be thinking this way and, and listening to these trends. Yeah, 100%. Um, you've got to, as a, as a company, you've got to make sure you're relevant to every generation. But of course, as, as a buying power starts shifting, um, you've got to be studying this and really understanding what it means. What does it mean to you as an organization? What does it mean to your team? And just the whole store experience, the manufacturing experience, e-commerce experience, the expectations of the customer, you got to go through and define it and make sure that you do a good job with focus groups and understanding what their needs and wants are and just find out what this customer is really about. Because we built our business, let's be honest, around baby boomers. 
we have. Yep. And uh, everything that we do, how we advertise, the look of our stores, the look of our product was all built around that generation. And we have to be really careful. We don't lose the baby boomers because they're just they're starting to diminish. They're not gone. Um, but we've also got to be looking at the newer customer and do it at a pace that we can all absorb, um, because otherwise you can end up being like J.C. Penney's and you do it too fast. And then it, it alienates your current customer. You know, the um, um since we'd always like to have this kind of this continuing conversation, you're, you're leading me into a couple of areas here that I think we should just kind of, kind of stay here for a second. So when you talk about um, this, these you know, relevance of, of product and things of that sort, can we get a little, little granular? Cause a lot of the questions that come in, people really want to know like right now, and maybe if you can extrapolate into, into the next year, what are the categories that, that you think um, you're going to be able to, you know, count on as foundational that you're going to be able to stand on that's going to carry through, continuing slow growth or or you know very very modest growth you mean categories like bedroom sure any any yeah case any any yeah. of those any of those things and, and maybe take each each one each at one at a time well mark i think that if you look at the fastest growing category that that usually um is a replacement category is your mattress or your sofa um because you sit on them they get dirty you wear them out faster than you do a piece of bedroom furniture so there's no question that upholstery um, and, and mattresses are probably going to go through a different buying cycle than the others. You know, one of the reasons the industry suffered over the last 12 months um, was because all that money got pulled ahead and uh, all the demand got pulled ahead. I'm sorry, $50 billion of demand got pulled ahead over a 21, 22, 2021 20, and 22 period of time because of all the stimulus that went in the marketplace. So that means that everybody may bought, maybe bought a new bedroom set, a new dining room, um, new upholstery set, new occasional tables, new mattress. And the cycle of wear on those products is different. Uh, for example, a sofa may wear out every six years or seven years. Um, a mattress, they like to have everybody replace their mattress every seven or eight years. Um, you know, of course, you know, those are those are what I would call the replacement products. Other things like bedroom furniture and dining room furniture just wears out on a longer cycle, maybe a 10 year cycle. So you're going to see that whole replacement cycle for those products go faster, um, upholstery and mattresses than than case goods and dining and and bedroom well. Um, but I think that's probably going to be biggest be the biggest driver that we have in the industry is is those categories and and how those categories are going to drive growth. You know, it's it's interesting. It's um, and when you talk about when you talk about those those areas, are you seeing that it's across the board when it comes to to price category as well or is that um are we seeing more on that you know the the low to mid end where, where are you seeing the differences there as far as that spectrum well um and this is something i went through with the economists as well um there's 66 percent of the consumers in the marketplace are under stress um that's a lower income customer that's living typically in a rental house um, rent has skyrocketed on them over the last three years. If you look at rent in markets like Tampa, it's gone from $1,800 to almost $3,000 for the same home or the same apartment. Crazy. You talk about inflation and taking money out of people's pockets, food prices and everything else. So that consumer on the low end is really stressed. I'm not saying that we don't need to do a great job taking care of that customer. We must do a great job taking care of that customer and offering great values. But they're more price conscious than ever before. And, and they're shopping more than ever before. And in some cases, they may end up, uh, you know, in a rent center or something like that instead of going to a furniture store. I'm not saying they've disappeared. I, I don't want to make that statement at all because they haven't disappeared to the market. They're just smaller than they were before because of buying power. The middle market and the high end, um, you know, I think the trends are all showing. doesn't matter whether it's furniture or autos or anything else. They're trading down as well. Um, so they're trading down at price point, much more price sensitive. Um, you know, we're seeing the people, even even some retailers I talk to, they're like, we're seeing restoration hardware customers walk into our stores. They've never seen it before, um, at least not at the pace and levels happening today. And uh, that just tells you that the customer is looking for value, very price conscious more than ever before. Not that they're out of the market, but they're very price conscious and they want to make sure they're getting a good deal for their money. Um, when there was a lot of money around and they felt really confident about the future, uh, you know that everything starts with trust and confidence. Um, if you have trust and confidence in an economy and your ability to earn, um, you're going to have more confidence spending. But as that's maybe under siege to a certain degree, um, you feel less confident, you obviously shop more. Even though you may need a new couch or a new bedroom set or a new mattress, 
you're going to shop more to make sure you get your best value. So I think there's a trade down overall happening in almost every price segment in the marketplace. And, you know, it's you just hit something so key, and that is, is that there seems to just be a continuous negative onslaught uh, to consumers out there, right? I mean, they just hear one negative thing after another. And so it's it's one thing to have the pressure in the pocketbook and it's another thing to lack what I would call the motivation uh, to get, you know, to, to spend and certain things like that. Is, is, is Are we overselling that? Or do you think this confidence issue is is maybe one of the biggest headwinds we have right now? No, I think it's the biggest headwind we have. And uh, the negativity of the media certainly affects people. Um, you know, it just doesn't feel good right now, you know, overall in the economy, and that, that gets in people's psychology, you know, whether it's a war, which is very unfortunate that it's happening um, in the Ukraine and Israel and, and uh, Hamas and, and what's going on there. Um, you know, these are things that get in people's psychology and that does affect them. And that's why, you know, when you have all these these loud noises all over the place, you can't whisper as an industry. We can't whisper. We've got to make sure that we've got a loud voice and we're communicating and talking to our customers and our employees to get through all the all the clutter, so to speak, and uh, make sure that we've got a clear message as an industry, as a business, as a company, as an employer um, to our people, because there's so many confusing messages going out there right now. So you got to amp it up and, and you got to be louder than ever before to be able to get recognition. Well, and also, I, I think you're also talking, at least I feel like you're going also about culture, right? You've got to have a strong culture that, that that's part yeah. of it. Um, yeah. Because that's, you know, these are the, these are those, those soft tissue things that really are the scale tippers right now. But before we get too far out of the, I don't want to take us out of the economy um, arena just yet. The other, you know, factor here that, that I know you and I have talked about that's really concerning is, and especially the numbers you just got are related to housing starts is, is kind of a a, a real kick. Yeah. Um, is is that also one of those metrics that you're particularly concerned about? Yeah, um, the numbers came out today um, that we have a 13 year low of housing starts, and I just got these numbers from Deutsche Bank in 2021. Seven million homes changed hands. Seven million homes changed hands. Doesn't mean all new builds. It means buy and sell. Um, in 2023, 4.9 million homes are estimated to change hands. So that's a uh, with almost two and a half, 2.2 2 million person or 2 million household drop uh, that you have over that period of time. And that, that does impact home furnishings. Um, it certainly does. And, you know, that, that has an impact on, you know, whether we're trailing indicator to housing, which everything I've read looks like we're about six months behind the housing industry and housing starts. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it feels like, you know, maybe there's a little bit of tailwind or headwind coming there, but you have this tailwind of the millennials coming in. And uh, that's something I get excited about, even though, you know, they're, they're moving out of their parents' basements and, you know, they're, they're getting married, they're having kids, they're doing all these things that, that are important in life. And uh, I think we just have to do a great job finding that customer as an industry. And, and it sounds to me like you have to be, this is a long game though, uh, with, what you're, with what you're talking about, about yeah. the fact that we're not looking for a, we're not seeing a huge uptick here coming up in the next maybe 18 months that, this is a, this is the steady course time, right? This is the yep. re, re, do the do the proper things that you need to be doing. Um, let me ask you this: as we're painting this picture, I, I just I just wonder about, you know, what what does the future really look like for independent retailers? Because uh, in our in our sector, um, not a pretty picture. Do you, do you have legitimate concerns about the independent in this uh, in this day and age with with all that you're seeing? I, I just everything comes around adaptability and your ability to adapt to the current environment. Um, you know, I think that's a big piece, but you know, UBS came out with a report uh, about a year and a half ago where they said 7,000 retail stores in the furniture industry will shutter, um, 20,000 apparel stores will shutter, and I think 12,000 electronic stores will shutter. Um, they just revised that uh, today. I just actually got the report. Now they're saying 4,000 between now and 2027 will uh, shutter home furnishing stores. Obviously, two years have passed since they put out the last survey of the last mm -hmm. uh, analysis. So, um, yeah, I, I think that there is definitely a threat. Um, it's a question of who's going to adjust and, and how do you make sure that you're relevant to your business model. And I don't think, you know, I, I have the saying, Nito Cobain actually came up with it, and I use it probably every day in some form or another. This whole question about if somebody had to pay admission to come into your store, would they? Like going to a, a theater 
and you know paying five dollars or ten dollars i don't even know what the cost is anymore twenty dollars to get into to watch a movie <laughs> would right. somebody pay that money to come into your store and i ask this of people all the time i just came back from high point not high point market on monday and i probably asked the question to 150 different people and nobody said yes now we should be concerned about that as an industry you know and certainly this ashley home stores aren't immune to that either um, but nobody said yes now how are you going to create the excitement and entertainment where somebody would pay money to walk into your store. And, you know, we think we're just selling a product. Well, we're, we're actually selling theater. Uh, we're selling an enjoyable environment. We're selling an experience. So I buy into the numbers to a certain degree, but I also know that you can buck the trend and take market share. And, uh, you know, they're also talking about the fact that there's going to be more people that shift from, from brick and mortar stores to e-commerce. And quite honestly, you know, if you read deeper, it's really an omni-channel experience. Yeah. So you have to have a great website. You have to have a great store experience. You have to have a great web experience. you got to make them all seamless. And that just becomes an imperative. And I think companies that do that, Mark, are the ones that will survive. And it doesn't matter what happens in the economy. You know, yeah. I've, been, I've been around long enough. I, I've seen people um, take their business and, and thrive during a tough economy. And others go out of business. So it just depends on the persistence and tenacity of the leader and the team. So since I have you here, I have to ask then, what, what do you think are the key things that have allowed you to continue to keep Ashley Furniture Industries ahead of that curve? Um, what are the things? Because I know, um, I mean, I've got a little inside information here, but I mean, I know some of the things that you're doing on a daily basis, but would you mind sharing some of the things that, that you're doing to not only hold yourself accountable, but the team and everything else and really moving forward? Well, for those of you that know my dad, uh, you'll know he's a grinder, and I'm a grinder. Um, number one, we're we're family owned. Um, you know, we believe in this business. We invest all of our money back into the business every year. Um, you know, we don't take dividends. We we buy ro we buy robots because Warren Buffett says this all the time. The best investment you can make is in yourself. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a private company. We don't have a lot of debt, and we're able to take all of our money and put it back into our organization. But uh, it just takes this mindset around continually asking the why. What's happening? What's happening in the environment around me? What do we have to do? You've got to understand technology and, and capability of your team and pour love and, and knowledge into your team every time you get a chance and find a way to really get them to raise the level and raise the expectations. And I think that's quite honestly the secret to our success is the fact we've got great people that work for us. Um, but we're also willing to take risk and make investments and we'll travel. We have a saying, we, uh, one of our core values is dirty fingernails, which means that you've got to travel the world and you've got to look at what's happening around you and the environment around you and make sure that you can be successful over the long term. So um, that's one of the key attributes that I look at in leadership is, are you curious? Are you courageous? Are you risk taking? Um, not stupid risk taking, but going out there and mm -hmm. taking risk and trying new things. Um, that's really the, what leads you to success. And I'm more optimistic now, Mark, today than I was three years ago or two years ago because it was so chaotic two years ago. Now it, the noise has settled down, right? It's maybe not as nice and good as it was as far as business where, you know, every day you look at your orders like, wow, we had a great day. No, it's not quite that way. It's not terrible, but, you know, it's just a grind. And I love the grind of going out and winning and competing. I believe growth must be earned. And to do that, you've got to innovate. And I've got a new mantra at Ashley Furniture, which is we want to be the most competitive and innovative furniture company on the planet. That's our mantra. And as an organization, you know, we're making the investments in our team and our capability and technology to be able to get there. Now, to me, one of the <clears throat> one of the words that uh, um, absolutely equates to a lack of success in business is timidity. And, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, too often it's easy to, to bunker in and hunker back kind of a situation. I think you're, you're saying you need to embrace the adversity and, and, and find your, find your pathways. Also, the one thing I, I'd love you to point out, cause I think it's a great template for everybody else is, um, you're also constantly asking your, yourself and the team to evaluate as you go. So this isn't one of those things where we're going to try this and then we'll reevaluate X number of times. I mean, you've got a real consistent look and always looking to make sure that you're that things are moving forward. You talk a little bit more about that because that's that's a big part of your edge as well. 
Yeah, and I, I think that's not just me. I think it's the organization. Again, we were we were mentored and taught by my dad, which is you know a great thing. And I've been able to take those ideas and accelerate them and and speed them up. Um, but we got a lot of great people around us. But yeah, I mean, you're always checking in. Um, you know, always checking in to see where are we at. We have some robotic cells that took us five years to develop. Now it would have been really easy just to give up versus being persistent. And we didn't give up. We just ground through it. The team kept on. We kept on investing in, in the capability. And now you go out and look at the floor and see those robots operate. And it's like, wow, it's amazing. And, you know, that's really fun to see. But it just takes time and energy to pour back into those concepts and those ideas and the commitment behind them to take them through and carry them through versus just giving up and saying, OK, let's move on. You know, you got to be really careful that you don't run after shiny objects too much. Uh, certainly, you need to make sure you know what the shiny object is and go and do the research to see how it could apply to your business. But on the same token, you just got to go through the daily grind of saying, how do we take these things from concept to product? And that's a big part of, of what we really focus on as an organization. And I know that one of the things that that you all are investing in, others are, and I think you would probably say everybody needs to, to a certain level, is, is of course, AI. Um, what right now... Uh, is is the biggest positive impact with AI when it comes to when it comes to um, your furniture business because um, it is something that is that is just in now in it just in everything we do. Oh, probably the most exciting thing that I've seen is AI. Um, you know, people talk about this, and you probably heard this story before. AI is as important and impactful to society as fire was to the caveman. Can you imagine living in the cave? where it's cold and your food can't be cooked, fire mm -hmm. was pretty important to him. Mm -hmm. As electricity was to man when electricity was developed, and you think of the industrial age and how it electrified the world. And now they're saying AI is going to be as impactful as those two things. And you would point to them and say they, they changed, I mean, they, they changed society. They changed how people lived. And the same thing's going to be true with AI. So we've embraced it. We appointed the chief AI officer. Uh, we've got a team that's deployed. We've educated our organization around AI. Um, as a matter of fact, we're deploying um, Copilot right now from Microsoft, which is, uh, I think, we're the fifth implementation in the United States for Copilot. We've got 500 licenses we're going to be deploying to our team. Many have already been using it. And the effectiveness of that tool is, is mind-blowing what it's doing. It, it links PowerPoint and Excel and Outlook together. But in addition to that, um, we've done a lot of training, as I said, uh, uh, our team has done organizational readiness studies by department to identify, are they a one to five? If they're a one, they're not ready for AI yet. If they're a three, they're ready for it. And we've identified 172 individual projects in our company today that can use AI. And uh, we've deployed it already in many cases. Uh, we've deployed it in transportation. We deployed it in accounts payable. Um, I believe the marketing department's deployed as part of it. Uh, many areas in our company have been deployed, uh, you know, uh, through AI, and these tools are incredible. Even HR, um, we've deployed it through HR as well for uh, going through the resumes and trying to identify, you know, whether they're capable of working for our company. And, and how do you respond to somebody that, that questions whether or not, quote unquote, we can afford afford the investment? <clears throat> I mean, there's different levels of what you can invest in when it comes to AI, but do you think that's that's foolish to not? that, that it, you just absolutely have to embrace it at some level. Um, but how would you, you know, how would you communicate that to other businesses out there? Well, my friend Peter Amanda says, says it best. By the end of this decade, there are two types of companies, two types of companies. One that's in business using AI, the second one that's out of business. I think it's going to be that impactful. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean you need to go and spend hundreds of millions of dollars or a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars on it. It means you've got to go out and be curious today and understand these tools. Now, there's a tool called MidJourney right now, which we're using as, a, as an organization. They're using it for creative services within our company. Um, our design team is using it to help with design and designing our product. Um, it's unbelievable, the capability. What it can do in, in five minutes would take hours before. And we've got many, many examples of that. You know, our product knowledge team, what would take them three weeks, they got done in four days. Um, to do just through chat GPT and some of these capabilities and these tools are available. They're not expensive. It just comes back to getting a team that can really absorb it, understand it, and then taking it to the business and teaching them so they don't see it as a threat. 
um, because it really isn't a threat. It's an enabler. You still need the wisdom of humans to be able to drive AI. You know, it's great at calculating data. And I'll just give you one example of another area we implemented it in, which is forecasting. So if you think through our organization, we got manufacturing facilities, we got six distribution centers, 8,000 products. So imagine all the data it takes to be able to absorb, um, and 6,000 customers. All the data it takes to absorb all that information is impossible for a human being to do. Almost impossible. Now you put an AI over the top of that, and all that data feeds into it, it's able to calculate a forecast much more accurately than ever before. But it doesn't mean that the AI is going to do all that work. There's still got to be somebody checking it, making sure it makes sense, and making sure the wisdom of the business comes in to help it. And uh, a lot of people are saying it's going to make jobs obsolete. It's going to make jobs more effective is what it's going to do. It's going to speed it up and make sure that, you know, you're using your talent in the right ways, which is a real creative and thinking process within a business. So you know, it's funny. <clears throat> I mean, the word I hear you talking about here, and this this is what we could use in a, whether it's a small business or all the way up to yours, is efficiency. I mean, it sounds like every everything you just said says to me, you know, making it making a better. You talked about the forecasting, whether it's demand planning, whatever it might be. It's like just smoothing that out, giving you more yeah. information to be able to to react. I thought it was interesting. By the way, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna hold this up for a second. This you, many of you out there might have seen this ad for an AI company that featured Ashley, and this is the quote. It says, in-session intelligence is changing the way we drive omnichannel conversion more profitably. For every $1 invested in in-session marketing, we generated 17 times incremental revenue. Um, Todd, that's, that's a margin that you would take any day of the week. <laughs> any day. You know what I'm I'm, I mean, so so is, is that a, is that a good little microcosm of just a just a you know one little snippet here of, of how impactful AI can be just in this in session marketing alone? Yeah, I I would say so, but it takes a lot of work. Like I talked about that robotic cell that we developed that took five years. This isn't going to be turn the switch and all of a sudden, wow, we got a big payback, right? It it takes time, and it takes a lot of commitment of the team to be able to get this stuff over the goal line. Uh, we're early days of this. I mean, let's be honest, AI is really only a year old um, in, in the current form, current generation. And you start looking at that and it's publicly available now. Um, it's just, it takes understanding. It takes time. The other thing I want to urge everybody is don't put it out in the public domain. Get it behind your firewall. Uh, hopefully you have a firewall because cybersecurity is a big issue today. But you, if you're going to share data with it, Make sure the public domain can't get it. You have to put it behind your firewall and make sure you have protected data going in. And a lot of people, I don't think, are, are doing that. Um, you know, they're looking at it and saying it's out there in ChatGPT. Yeah, if you want the best restaurant in town, fine. Ask ChatGPT. But if you're going to take information around what's important to your company, you got to make sure you protect it. Huge risk there. That's that's a that's a, a wonderful point. I think I you know, appreciate that very very much. I you know, there's just um, so many so many different areas that I would love for us to talk about. One of the things that uh, I wanted to bring up that um, came up in a conversation that you and I had is, is also um, the need to be attentive um, now and moving forward with, with different sustainability issues. Um, can you talk a little bit ab about that? Because there, that's also something that's providing some pressure on business, et cetera. Can you talk about that? Uh, sustainability regarding the environment and, and products? Every, yeah, every, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I think more than ever before, it, it's a good time to be a corporate citizen and make sure we're we're protecting our environment. Um, so, you know, that that's important, not only to every business and our environment overall, but it's important to this millennial generation more so than ever before. You know, for my generation, yes, we we understood that and understand that we've got to be socially conscious of, of these things and, and make the right decisions on sustainability. But for this millennial generation, they grew up with that as part of their education. That was important to them. Um, it wasn't important to me. You know, they weren't teaching that when I was in school. They're teaching it now. So I think it's really important that we have sustainability, whether it's solar panels. And we got one of the biggest rooftop installations in the United States right now, one of our facilities. And a lot of our facilities are, generated, are generating solar power on rooftop, um, whether it's products and materials. Um, there's amazing capability in products and materials, and we use a lot of them. Um, through recycled materials and uh, things like that that you have to do. I think it's a right thing to do. Um, it's got to be affordable. It's got to make sense. 
And, uh, you know, I think the more moves that we can make there, and today I would say we're probably a 20 out of 100 or two out of 10. I mean, within two or three years, I'd hope we'd be a five out of 10. And in 10 years, I hope we're an eight out of 10 on sustainability. And, and that's that's the ride that we're going to go on as an organization and always look for those materials. You talked about the importance of the to the to the millennial. Um, so this is really something. It's not just about good corporate citizenship, it, but I, it sounds to me like you see this as really being an important piece of that relationship with the customer. Absolutely, I think the communication around that is going to be critical going forward. Whether it's things you do within your operation, like recycling, um, which many people do, they they recycle a lot of their cardboard and other materials. Whether it's the products, whether it's you know your solar panels or whatever you're doing, I think it's important to communicate those things and make sure people know that you are being responsible and uh, you're thinking thinking about the environment. The, um, uh, I'd like to also kind of get us back. There's just so many questions we've had come in that I, that I think kind of take us all over the, over the place here, but this is one I think is really good. Let's, let's go in store for a minute and let's talk about the fact of with all the technological advancement and everything else we've, that we've discussed and all these tools, where do you see the the role of of the uh, the RSA, you know, your retail sales associate? What do you see that looking like, you know, going forward? You know, we a few years back, it was all about the technology in their hand to be able to do certain things like this. But do you do you see that role evolving? And if so, what does it look like? Yeah, I think that uh, the RSAs really they're they're the guide through the stores, right? Very, very important to have a guide through the stores, but it's got to be an incredible experience. They have to know the product very well. They've got to understand the characteristics of the product. But, you know, things like QR codes are available in stores now, too. And AI is just going to help that out. You know, if you want to talk about one of the biggest applications that we see with AI, it's training and teaching the RSA. Because what should be able to happen is the RSA should be able to go up to a piece of bedroom furniture and say, what is the handle on the porter bedroom made out of? And it would just be able to pull up a bill of materials and spit it out for them and tell them this is a material it's made out of. So you're able to really educate yourself in a way like never before. And that would be accessible for the consumer at a certain level. You may not want to give them all the details, you know, and go through a complete bill of materials, but you can you can limit that. And that's one of the big opportunities I see going forward with AI. But the RSA is, is there to help guide, um, to help understand the customer, because it's still a person-to-person relationship when, when somebody walks in the store. They're going there to have an experience. And it's up to us to deliver that experience for the customer, which means you know the product, you understand the needs of the customer, you got EQ or emotion, you know, you're able to, to work with that customer and understand what they're thinking and their ideas, maybe help them out with some interior design ideas. I think those are all necessary. And I think the relevancy of, of the RSA today is probably more so than ever before, because that differentiates us from, from somebody who's buying online. That's that's now the the human the human touch, which is still critically important in this in this process. And one of the things that you talked about earlier is is that um, the importance of trust. And I I sense that this is one of those building blocks for uh, for building for building that with 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 the clientele. You know, that's a great word to throw out when you say trust. But how critically important? You know, I hear you talk about it a lot. But how critically important is that in, in making sure that you're that you're truly connecting to the customer? It's incredibly important. I mean, we've all bought something where it's like, ah, I don't really trust that guy or that girl, um, you know, and, and that's just the minute you lose that, you lose connection. And, you know, as we all know, selling is all about connection. And if you can maintain that connection with a consumer and get them excited about what they're buying and show them different things and different ideas and, and, and you know, it's like buying a new car. So I buy a new car, you know, I want to know everything about the car. My wife goes and buys a new car. She's like, give me the keys. <laughs> That's all she wants. She wants to drive off a lot. I'll figure it out later. I'll read the manual. And I'll figure it out. Right? So just two different personalities and how you want to digest data and, you know, the information that's important to you. And I think that an RSA, a properly trained RSA with proper information at their fingertips can do a fantastic job. And then we've got to make it seamless and fast. You know, all the track and trace stuff that's needed um, within you know, the consumer experience, that's just an expectation now. We got to get track and trace. If you have something go wrong in the home and, and Lord knows it happens, right? Because we're one of the only industries that go into the home. I mean, think about it. Maybe right. it's delivery and washer and dryers, but furniture and, and, and it's big and bulky trying to get it in the home in many cases. And you're going upstairs. A lot of things happen. 
And, uh, you know, it could be the, the driver walked in with dirty shoes, God forbid, or something happened as he's carrying the furniture up the stairs. That transaction's got to be easy. So they can get in there and get out quickly without having a lot of pain. And we got to meet them where they want to be met and how they want to be met. You know, what we're talking about is just good old basic interaction with it, with, with the customer. You can't forget that. And, I, and I, I kind of took you down that pathway because it's so easy to get into the tech conversation. And it's and it's it is bells and whistles. And it's amazing what it can provide. But also not to just lean on that 100 percent. That's got to be a, a, as, a, as I'll give you one of my quotes. It's a it's a means to an end, not an end unto itself is, is one of the ones that I, I had preached to me a long time. Right. Um, what, can you give a give a, a brief take also on I know it's been um, it went from uh, just extremes to now much, much different situation. But can you give uh, your take on the supply chain right now and how you see that uh, over the next few months and, and sort of where we are when it comes to that? Well, um, many things on the supply chain, because obviously that's where I spend a lot of my time is, is supply mm -hmm. chain and understanding the supply chain. Uh, my son is taking care of more of it now and doing a lot of the work I used to do. But um, you know, as you look at the supply chain, it's much more stable. I don't think we can point to anything and and say, okay, this is going to be a disruptor. I mean, I think the strikes are all over at the ports for the most part. Um, who knows what will come in the future, but we don't see any of that coming. The shipping issues now, they're doing a lot of blank sailings right now, which means really? that they're canceling, they're canceling vessels because they're not full. Um, so there's more capacity in the marketplace than there is demand. And they got many new big ships coming on. Um, so we don't really see a threat with um, with freight rates or anything like that because of the supply and demand. Um, but we do see an issue with blank sailings and supply chain disruptions where maybe a container shows up a couple of weeks late. Um, you know, all those things seem to continue to be continuing to happen. But as far as stability of supply chain, no, I don't I don't see anything in the next year that or even two years for the most part, maybe outside of a war um, that would disrupt the supply chain. Yeah, people so have been talking Oh, we're, in sorry. Good, we're in a pretty good spot, Mark. Good, um, because boy, we were in an opposite situation two <laughs> years ago. Holy smokes! Um, can you also talk a little bit about the trend? Um, and and this is talked about a lot in our industry, in particular about onshoring, uh, about some of the changes that have happened with some companies. You know, wanting to have more production uh, in this hemisphere and also in northern, you know, North and South America. Any thoughts about about that as well? Um, because that's that certainly is something that that still. I mean, we get we get it right. It is still something that can be a, a, certainly a positive aspect for some companies if there is another uh, major disruption of some sort. Well, I think Ashley, as we talk about onshoring, we never left, and uh, you know, about sixty percent of our product that we sell is made in the United States. Um, our upholstery products all made here. Uh, our bedroom furniture, paper laminated bedroom furniture, all is all made here. But it's it's harder right now because of the workforce. And, you know, the disruptions in the workforce, not a lot of people are coming out of school wanting to go to work in factories. Um, so you've really got to invest heavy into robotics if you're going to be in the United States and take away these heavy industrial jobs. And that's been our drive as an organization is to take those heavy industrial jobs away uh, where people are lifting up heavy weights over time or heavy materials um, and moving them from point to point. And you've got to be very focused on waste reduction. Um, because if, if you don't have those aspects, I mean, labor is a lot more expensive today than it was five years ago, a lot more expensive. And the cost of health insurance and everything else is much more expensive. So, you know, obviously, as you look at onshoring, you've got to be really smart at what you're pulling onshore. Um, you can't pull a fully finished bedroom in the United States anymore. That won't work. Um, that's something that's got to be done overseas. Upholstered products you can still make here, but you better be heavily focused on robotics and you got to pick your points and, and pick the areas where you, where you can compete and what you can do in the United States. And then make sure you have an appetite to invest, invest in robotics and technology um, and educate your team on, on continuous improvement or waste reduction. And I think you can onshore. And I, I think there's a great future towards it. But if you think you're going to come here and just build a product, you know, like you do in Vietnam or China, it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. Um, the U.S. economy is different than that today. And the workforce is different than that today. You know, you, you touched on workforce here related to, um, uh, you know, to the manufacturing center. Do you see any other uh, pressures from the labor standpoint that could um, negatively impact our industry? Yeah, um, you know, the NLRB is is definitely um, changing quite a bit. I mean, we see the UAW strikes um, and what's happening there. And, and I'm sure many people here have been looking at the UAW strikes. I mean, those are risks. 
you know, we take great pride in the fact that we want to have a direct relationship with our employees. We don't want anybody between us and our employees. And we have no union operations within our within our within our system. And we want to maintain that. Um, but, you know, the laws are getting more aggressive. Um, the unions are getting more aggressive. So I think it's really important for everybody to have a great relationship with their employees and to make sure you're with market as far as pay and benefits um, and, you know, that you've got uh, good communication established and you're and, working through problems and taking care of problems. And of course, when we were in the in the throes of COVID, um, you know, we saw what, um, you know, where labor costs went went there. Has it has anything sort of normalized or is it still uh, do you feel there's still some some pressures there? Because I know there was a, a you know a lot of concern about somebody across the street, um, you know, uh, giving a fifty cents or a dollar more an hour and just you know yanking people back and forth. Is that stabilized at all, or is there still some challenges there? No, there's still a lot of challenges. I think everybody on the phone can or on the on the webinar can certainly attest to this fact. There, there's just a lot of challenges, and it's not based on competition as as much as it is inflation, and just the cost of living for these people. I can't blame somebody. For, for looking for a job that pays a little more money today in this environment. I mean, it's really unfortunate what's happened to our U.S. economy and inflation. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Go and try to buy a new car. I mean, it's it, I mean when I was young, cars were relatively inexpensive. And today you go and try to buy a used car, it's hard to find one under 40 grand. And, uh, you know, it's a completely different environment. So, you know, when you start talking about the pressures, a big part of it's doing the right thing for your employees. Yeah, we're competing. You know, we're all competing for labor, but... My gosh, I mean, what it takes to to pay your bills and maybe send a child to college or to tech school, wherever they're going, and pay for clothes and gas and food and everything else, it's a different environment for them. And, you know, I can't blame any person for wanting more money because it is really tough keeping up with what's happening in this economy today. And so, quite, honest, quite honestly, the habits are different, too. You know, right. they, they call it a fun economy, Right. Um, over the last couple of years, it's turned into what they call a fun economy, which means people are inter- they're, they're more they're spending more money on entertainment than ever before, and uh, you know the services economy, so to speak, and you know that's what's been happening versus a consumer goods economy, and that's a big shift in in buying patterns, buying power, and and that's taken a lot of money out of people's pockets too. I mean, I, I know you're not suggesting just, you know, just to overpay people, but would you suggest to anybody watching this that if you're not really keeping an eye on being competitive in what you're offering, then you're just going to be, you're just going to be churning like crazy your staff? Is that, I mean, is that a critical right now? That's very critical. And and understand the marketplace, doing wage surveys, you know, continuously. We used to do them every year. Well, now we got to do them every four or five months and understand what's happening around us. And and that's that's a critical part of business is making sure you're taking care of the needs of your employees. And, uh, you know, we do things like, you know, we give away turkeys for Thanksgiving, you know, we give away a lot of free meals for our employees, you know, during the week, um, just things like that, that kind of lessen the burden. Um, you know, we, we, we're fortunate that uh, we do profit sharing, we've done profit sharing, we do it right before Christmas, we do it almost every year. Um, we haven't missed a year in, in probably 30 years. And uh, we try to give our employees something so they're able to touch their families and, and have a better Christmas. Little things, little things that matter, right? I mean, these are the scale tippers from keeping keeping someone or losing them to somebody across the street. Um, great question came in too about um, what do you feel overall um, is going to be the uh, the trend when it comes to uh, pricing in, in in home furnishings? You know, we we saw the obviously the big increase during the heat of COVID and the supply chain issues, et cetera. Where do you see pricing sort of taking us into this next six, 12, 18 months? Mark, I think we're probably back to 2019 prices or less um, in many cases. You know, we're at that level again. So when you talk about pre-COVID prices, I, I think certainly we are as a company. We're almost, we're there. You know, some of our products are a little more expensive, but it's not because of price, not, not because of design, it's because of the price points and, or the product, I should say, and what we built into the product. So, you know, that's that's part of it, Mark, you know, that prices are are stabilized um, you know, I think that overall, everybody's seen their costs go up, you know, the cost of insurance, cost of labor, cost of rent, all of those things have increased. So are we 100% back when you start looking at the total cost of doing business? No. Um, you know, but when you start looking at roughly where we were, I'd say we're close. But when you get to retail, for example, you know, it's it's more expensive to run a retail store today than it was before. It just is. Or do home delivery or whatever it happens to be. So it's just a it's a big difference. Do you, 
And is that a good thing? I mean, I mean, is it is it good to say we're back to where we were pre pre pandemic? Or are you concerned that maybe the the rebound back that direction is is too far? No, I think it's a good thing. I think as an industry, we have to be and we must be focused on value and giving the customer a great value for for their money. Because again, they're going to be shopping more. I think if the furniture is too expensive, you're going to have less customers. And you know, we don't want less customers. We want more customers. And you know, I saw Bill Napier just put something up about regional banks tightening their credit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's that's very true. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's regional banks or the underwriting of of some of the big companies that do consumer financing. Um, it's going to be much more difficult to get financing for these consumers. So. Are they going to buy a three thousand dollar bedroom set? Or are they going to buy a thousand dollar bedroom set? Uh, my my bet is I'd rather sell them a thousand dollar all cash bedroom set, or something that they can get financed, than sell them a three thousand dollar bedroom set. So you've got to be thinking through the dynamics and how this marketplace is shifting, and make sure that that you're relevant to what those customers want. And 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 you're tapping into something. By the way, <laughs> I love it when a guest gets to the question before I do. That was fantastic. <laughs> um, that, was, that was wonderful. Um, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll come back in five minutes. And we'll, no, I'm kidding. Um, but but you bring up a really great point here that I think is something that we talked a lot about at market with a number of people that came through our resource center. Is is the whole fluency in in financing and all levels of financing, primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. Um, it seems to me that um, if um, you're not really uh, putting a lot of attention on that, that, that you're missing out as well, because it was interesting. One of the takeaways from some of the tertiary companies was trying to convince store owners that it's not their money, that they're yeah. trying to make decisions for the person coming in saying, well, I don't want to, no, let them, allow them to do that. Um, talk a little bit about that, because that's a big, big part of the sales process today in this kind of an environment is all the, all the financed uh, yeah. Transactions. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the biggest player in this area is either TD Bank or Synchrony. And, you know, of course, they're always looking at their underwriting. But I mean, they, they've both been very good and more transparent probably than they were in 2007, 2008, 2009 in those time periods. But if you get denials on, on a first look, you better have a second look in place. And if that second look is denied, you better have a third look, which is typically a seam or some kind of rental mechanism. Um, and I would think that any retailer that's that's really thinking through their process and making sure they get every customer through would be focused on those things. And I think it's proven that you can probably get 90% of the people through a financing funnel if you have all three options. So if somebody's applying for financing, anywhere from 80 to 90% of the consumers should be able to make through make it through and have an option. So I think that's important as we move forward. And as you may get more denials in the top end, you know, the first look. Your second looks there, and the second look gets more denials. Your third looks there. Uh, again, our job is to sell furniture. Our job is to deliver furniture. That's what we all want to do. So I think you've got to say yes rather than no. Yeah, and I just and and it's I always t tell people it's not your money. Don't you know? Don't, don't you know? Don't project onto the customer how you feel about it. If they're if they make that decision about how they want to purchase. Um, then you need to be the one there to to provide those options. Yeah, it's 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 and right now it's just it's absolutely critical. Um, I have to um, uh, ask you a, a question that's very self serving for us here at HFA, and I, I just really want before we end our you would never do it today. self serving, Mark. The car, never, never, Todd. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we had, and I'm gonna I, I'm not gonna get into many of the details, but you and and I and a few people had a uh, some pretty heavy duty conversations last January because the industry um, kind of woke up to the fact that we had a major um, issue we were working on relating to tip over and the Sturdy Act. Um, and so many people sort of woke up in January, like, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? And people like you and your dad, who helped to lead these efforts for the last few years, not months, uh, same thing with HFA and HFA. I mean, everybody was doing all this sort of thing. So everybody kind of woke up and we really were able to celebrate um, you know, not an easy law, but certainly one that had consensus from all the groups involved. My concern is we have a number of other issues that are coming up too. There's always a constant level like this. My concern, Todd, is that people are stepping back into the shadows again and just doing their thing. Can you talk about from where you sit, the importance of the advocacy piece and the vigilance needed? Because I, I just, I just don't want to lose that momentum. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, certainly what happened over tip over in the last 
couple months before we came to a resolution was amazing. The industry came together. The phone calls were made. Uh, everybody really stepped up. And I want to thank you for that, Mark, and HFA and the work they did as well. Um, they were all leading. You were leading the charge. HFA was leading the charge. And members were leading the charge. And that was critically important to get crazy legislation killed. Not killed. Uh, reasonable. And yep. what we ended up with a conclusion there was 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 great. And, you know, I think that's to be commended based on the work that the industry did. And I, I think we're going to see a good result from that all the way around. You're right. There's there's a lot of things on the horizon. I mean, we see some radical movements happening, some some things happening overall um, that are concerning. And we have to make sure that we align as an organization and that that HFA and HFA, uh, all your members are, are fully engaged in this process. I mean, there's something going on with recliners right now, um, which mm -hmm. is going to change the news for us um, and how, how recliners are manufactured and retailed. Um, there's several other acts that are, are being considered that we've got to make sure that we're aligned on. Um, because if this falls apart and our alliance isn't strong and we're not really focused on what those things mean to the industry and being able to interpret it and have our voice heard, more importantly than anything, we want our voice heard because they put some legislation through and it raises the price two thousand dollars on something. You just it just go away. It won't be sold. Yep. And there's got to be a point of reasonableness around some of these things. Well, and you know, it's um, it's interesting too. And I, you know, like I said, you and your your dad have been instrumental. But interesting enough, there were people that made differences. And I'm talking about single store retailers that had a great relationship with a member of Congress that that yeah. helped to really make this happen. So it's not just it's not just up to the big guys to handle it. It's everybody. And so. It's a shameless commercial, but I just really think it's important because all, we we all have a stake in in these in these uh, in these issues. So thank you for for helping me with that. I think it's also important, Mark, as we make donations as we're going to an election period. As we make donations, you you got to be clear with your legislators that you know you want a voice in this process, and they got to help. If you make a call, they got to help us, and we're not going to do anything crazy. We want to protect people as well. We don't want to have a product that you know, causes a lot of issues uh, within consumers' homes or deaths or anything like that. That's absolutely the last thing in the world I want to go to bed with is something happened that that somebody got injured. Um, but, you know, it's important for us to make sure we have a voice. And as you make donations to your legislators and representatives, make sure that you make, they, they understand that you expect them to be there when we call. And we need to also point out, and that Sturdy was a good example when it came to uh, one of the governmental agencies is, is there's there are some adversarial relations out there. There are people that that don't like our industry, not for anything that's happened, but just because they put a target on us and you just have to fight against that. I mean, that's that's just not you know, that's just not right. And uh, and this of course, this battle, we managed to push back against some adversarial points of view that were just terrible. So right. um, I appreciate I appreciate that very very much. We do have a, a, a couple of quick minutes here. I want to get one really good question that just came in here. It says, with over four hundred and sixteen thousand new apartment complexes being built this year, how has your merchandising shifted to what they're saying single item purchase and smaller size chairs and sofa, et cetera? Are you guys also adapting to that trend? Absolutely. Um, we've we've made significant efforts in that area, um, and you know, there's no question that there's there's a lot of apartments. And, you know, as, as credit gets more expensive, I should, as, as debt gets more expensive and home loans, you're going to see smaller homes being built. It's not that there isn't going to be homes built, but instead of a, a 4,000 square foot mega mansion, it's going to be a 2,500 square foot home. And, you know, that's what's going to happen. You're going to see this whole thing cycle down in sizes and scale. And, uh, you know, we're doing our best to adjust to that and make sure that, you know, we get our products in the marketplace that, that accommodate that customer. We just came out with a product called Just Modern which was all modern, uh, modern living, modern styles with small spaces. And one of our designers, Angel, did a great job developing that product and, you know, great mindset. She's a millennial and she really developed product that, that's paying up. It's really great. Wow. Okay. Well, that's, you know, that once again, this goes back to what we talked about about an hour ago, which is that adaptability and just really paying attention to the marketplace. Todd, I, I just can't thank you enough um, for spending this hour with us. Um, I know this is one of those, uh, webinars and when it goes on demand tomorrow that a lot of people are going to listen to and 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 the takeaways etc but i think what i appreciate more than anything is that um these are rough times this is uh tons of headwind but um, i appreciate the fact that you always seem to have a level of optimism that you find in the you know through through the cracks sometimes when things seem very dark so i appreciate that very very much but um i thank you for taking part of this webinar today um, massive massive opportunities ahead of us Let, let's not forget that 
you know, you got to go out and take market share. We talked about the fact growth must be earned. Go and get market share. Be aggressive. Don't be passive. Be aggressive. And these are going to be great times for those that do. Can't end it any better than that. Todd Wanick, Ashley Furniture Industries, thank you for joining us. I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. And as always, we like to wish you not only great sales, but good health. I'm Mark Schumacher. On behalf of all of us here, I thank Todd and I thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.